Stephanie, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time. You're such a beautiful soul from the research I've done, and I'm so grateful to have joined you today. Thank you for, for coming here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to talk about so many passions and interests that we share and to dig into all of it. Yeah. So we were talking briefly before about intention, and I figured a good place to start would be with the intention you do every morning, which is to say, I'm so lucky and grateful to be alive, and I will use this day to produce happiness for others and all beings everywhere. Where does this come from? Oh my gosh, you did do your research on me. <laughs> I'm so touched, first of all. I cribbed that from a combination of uh, the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh, and then it has become a practice for me of sort of, uh, I guess it would be kind of setting my compass for the day. I have come to believe over the years of my, of my studies, as well as my personal experience, that being of service to our fellow human beings is the path to true happiness and fulfillment. And it's such a beautiful intention. I think all of us share it. You know, we all want to be kind. We all want to do good, but it's hard sometimes, right? Like when life is running at you and there's so much that you need to get done when there's a boss messaging you and, you know, when there's all of these pressures from the world around us and not to mention there's all of these kind of re realities of life that we all have to navigate every day, like paying our bills and <laughs> navigating the world. And I have found that setting that intention helps me to, to come back to it as much as I can, knowing that there's always room for improvement. I'm never going to get it perfect, but at least it can be there as kind of that, that anchor for me. Could you take us to a time when you didn't have a service oriented approach and maybe we could paint the picture forward? Yeah, of course. So really this, this approach, uh, it stemmed from, from my own life and it was the result of following the societally prescribed path of what you should do in order to be happy. And for me, the manifestation that that took for me was you need to get good grades. You need to go to a great school. You need to get a great job. You need to be the best at that great job. You need to be the first to get promoted. You need to, you know, get the nice apartment and the specific hobbies and like all this kind of materialistic um, per, uh, performance-based metrics in order to, to earn happiness. And so I did all of that stuff. And then I looked around at one point and realized I was actually quite miserable <laughs> and none of it was working for me. And I was first I was incredibly pissed off because I was kind of like, well, if this is what I was supposed to work, right? Like I spent all this time and effort doing these things, some of which I really didn't enjoy in order to, you know, earn my happiness. And so first I was angry. It was like the five stages of grief, right? Like first I was really mad and then I was really upset. And then eventually I got curious, like, why, why, why did this happen to me? And I, that's what really kind of has led me on my, my work for the last 10 years or so. And so the version of me back then um, was really just, you know, interested in pursuing achievements and, um, you know, kind of racking up milestones and um, prioritizing that versus, um, thinking about these, these things that I'm, I'm more focused on now. And not to say that I think I'm an entirely different person than I was back then, but I, I feel as though there has been a fundamental transformation from this mindset shift that has really transformed my outlook on life and really helped to guide me through, through the last 10 years or so of my life. With the anger piece of it, who were you angry at? <laughs> Myself, probably. <laughs> Um, and you know, like this is such a, such a cop out, but society, right? Like the world around us. And, you know, I wasn't angry at anyone in my life really, like all our, anyone who's trying to encourage us to follow these, these pursuits, they, 
they're, they don't want bad things for us. They want us to be happy and successful. And this is kind of the predominant operating model that we've been given in our world. There wasn't really another option. And I remember when I started to stumble upon this line of thinking that potentially actually altruism and service and giving back and, you know, being in relation to one another and all of these things actually lead you to happiness. I remember thinking like, well, really like no one told me that, like that wasn't really something that was prioritized or talked about or focused on in, in at all the same way that was, you know, like getting good jobs, getting good grades, um, kind of racking up more of the achievement oriented stuff. So I wasn't mad really at anyone other than just myself for kind of listening because I knew in my heart of hearts that it wasn't really the right, the right thing for me. Um, and then also just feeling like kind of heartbroken over it. You know, there's so many people out there who want to be happy and who are working so hard to do so. And I just see it happen time and time again, where, you know, they, they set their sights on an achievement. They go out and they push themselves so hard to get it. And then they get there and it's like, you're happy for a day or two. And then kind of that feeling fades away. And, um, I just, I think we can do better. I think we can, I think we can find a way to make it, to help people to find happiness while also serving the greater good. Do you think you needed to go through that path of achievement focused in order to get to the point of service? That's a great question. Probably on some level, um, probably, I think we're all, you know, one thing I think that's really important when we're talking in any sense about personal development or growth is respecting people where they're at on their journeys, because we all are navigating a completely unique set of circumstances with specific challenges and requirements. And then that all changes year to year, month to month. And there's, there's, um, there's no real way to know what somebody else is going through on their path. And so I think that having my, my journey, I probably needed to have that experience. I know people who don't, <laughs> who just, who, who kind of have, uh, have skipped that, that need to have the rough wake up call. But for me, it was obviously something I needed. And, um, I think that however we come to the realizations that we need to hear in the moment, that's, that's how it's supposed to unfold for each of us. And that's kind of the beautiful thing where we all can learn from one another about these different paths and these, these different approaches to living a meaningful and a good life. Yeah. You bring up a wake up call and I know you wrote an incredible piece about your own wake up call. So I would love to dive into that story if you'd be comfortable sharing, because it really hit me and I think it will hit people who are listening as well. Yeah, of course. Um, so this was the moment that I alluded to where I sort of woke up and realized, wow, this is, I'm not really living in alignment with what is true to me. And for me, that manifested as I was working full time as a management consultant in New York City. And I had done two years of the analyst program, which is a, you know, really kind of demanding two year program. I was traveling like four days a week around the country and working these really long hours and basically kept pushing through, even though I started getting all of these signals from my body and my mind that that was not what I was supposed to be doing. So the first one was um, one day I just woke up and I had completely erupted in full body psoriasis, which has, it can look a lot of different ways. It looks a little bit like a rash, but for me, it looked like, like scales had erupted all over my entire body and even my face and everywhere else. And it was incredibly uncomfortable. And, um, I was really ashamed of it. It was really itchy. It was summer and I had to cover it up because I was so embarrassed about it, even though there's nothing wrong with it, which I can see now in retrospect. And I just kind of ignored it. I was like, okay, everything's fine. I'll just go and this will go away at some point. Then I started having panic attacks and um, feeling just like these waves of crushing anxiety. Um, 
I stopped sleeping. Basically like every part of my body and mind was kind of going like, you need to pay attention to something. And I just kept pushing through and pushing through. And then finally, at one moment, I um, was in my apartment and I just honestly kind of collapsed onto my bedroom floor in tears and lay there in this kind of moment of pain and sadness and of kind of coming to terms with myself, I would say, and had this moment of clarity and insight that something in my life needed to change and really that something was me (laughs) it was it was not something that um you know would be easy to blame my job or New York all of which I did but in in reality looking back with a couple of years under my belt of of perspective it was just it was me it was it was my approach to living and uh after that I Um, the next day I called my company and I asked them to transfer me to California and I thought I would have a better chance of finding some more kind of work-life balance and being closer to my family and they made it happen which I was eternally grateful for and I started packing up my apartment and I was gone within three weeks and moved to San Francisco and that kind of kicked off a really interesting adventure of trying to figure out what mattered to me and what I wanted to pursue. And ultimately that kind of led to exactly to where I am today because I started to um, explore a positive psychology, which led me to Penn and has led me to where I am. So it's one of those moments where you would never, um, I never would have guessed in retrospect that, you know, that moment of, of pain and sadness would lead to, to a lot of beautiful things actually. Yeah. And so I want to go back to when you're in this state of just the psoriasis is overwhelming mm-hmm. you. Why do you think it took so long for you to finally come to that realization? And what could you have told yourself to expedite the process of you figuring out that you needed to be in a different location? Mm. What a great question. I think that the main thing I could have told myself would have been just pause, just stop. Like I was running a million miles an hour trying to escape myself, like doing everything I could to push past my emotions, my thoughts, my big red flashing alarm sign that was going off inside of me. Like I was just doing whatever I could to ignore that and to push it down, like just kind of keep piling more and more bricks on top of it. And, you know, the, the minute that I started to listen to myself, the pain sort of went away. It didn't, it didn't disappear right at that moment, but it became something I could process and work through and uh, address rather than kind of, you know, this monster under the bed that I was determined to pretend wasn't there, which is how I was treating it. And so the main takeaway for me from that time is that I need to integrate space, which for me is like quiet time alone, where I'm just have the job of listening to myself. Like, what are you feeling? What are you going through? Um, what are you not looking at purposefully? What are you avoiding? All these kind of questions to bring that to my mind. Um, I don't think that if I had been doing that back then, that my body would have given me such dramatic signals. And to that point, I have never had an issue with psoriasis ever again. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> it's so, pretty wild. <laughs> so listening to yourself is something I often say on this podcast. What does that mean exactly for you? Mm. You know, I think it it takes different forms for me. Like one, I'm I'm not sure what your experience is. I'd love to hear, but I feel like there are certain times in my life and also certain moods that help me to tap in, like different activities help me to tap into different things. You know, one thing that I love to do is going on a walk and just like allowing myself to kind of chew on a problem or something, you know, often 
just set out with the intention of being like, let's just go and like feel and think and take 15 minutes to do it. And, you know, you can put on music and kind of like soundtrack yourself, which is always fun. Um, I love doing that, but sometimes that doesn't work for me. And other times it's um, like free writing in journaling. Um, So for anyone who's listening, who hasn't heard of that, just basically you set a timer and then your only task is to write until the timer goes off without stopping and not censoring yourself at all. For someone like me who clearly had some issues with like suppressing my feelings and thoughts and emotions, I find that really helpful because it gives you, it's like a release valve. Um, And then the third thing I do is I talk to myself quite a bit. (laughs) So like if I have a problem, I'll, talk to myself like I'm talking to a friend and say out loud like okay Stephanie so tell me about this thing that's going on in your life you know the way one of my girlfriends would do and then I'll say talk about it and then oftentimes as I'm talking I'll have that insight that you have when you know when you're talking to a friend and you kind of see things so much more clearly for them and there's actually a bunch of research to back that up which is super cool um so those are like those are three of the tools that I've personally found to be really helpful. Yeah. And on that last one as well, you can also record yourself, just talk out and record and then listen to it back and a bunch of insights come out. That's a great idea. I've never tried that. I'm going to have to give that a shot. Yeah. So I'm curious, were these something, were these ways of listening to yourself that you discovered over the past, I don't know, 10 years or what were they things that you grew up with? Um, they were things more that I discovered. Um, I, I don't, my, my parents always encouraged me to write about my feelings, which I still do a lot. So I always had that as a tool. Um, but these ones more were things that I, I stumbled into out of necessity, um, in trying to figure out for myself, like, oh my God, I'm totally lost. (laughs) I need to figure out something that helps me. And something that helps me quick. And so those are, um, there, there are things that I either just like fell into, or oftentimes what I'll do is, um, if I find a piece of like interesting research about this stuff, I'll try and turn it into an experience or an exercise that helps me. And so that's how I, um, started the doing the talking to yourself one after I read some studies about it. So just kind of like crafting little tools for myself, whatever the circumstance dictates. Very cool. So take us along the journey. You moved to San Francisco and when do you get it in your head? Like, oh, I'm going to study positive psychology. Mm. So I moved to San Francisco. I spent about 10 more months working as a consultant there. And then I got recruited to go work at LinkedIn. And while I was at LinkedIn, I really started getting into these topics and I started getting really, really into meditation and mindfulness and had these, you know, really profound experiences with that. And then I started, wait, 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 we can't just skip over that. (laughs) (laughs) Like what? Oh, you know, just the usual stuff of realizing (laughs) that like your brain is just a chattering little monster sometimes. (laughs) Um, but it still feels profound when you find it. I don't think anything that anyone who's listening wouldn't have experienced, but I think just, I think for, for me, meditation, having both the, the experience of like profound, the ability to detach from your thoughts and then paradoxically, and at the same time, the ability to feel at one with all of humanity is just this like incredible cocktail of experience for transformation. And I really just worked with that, those kind of two concepts for a couple of years. And it just gave me, it gave me all of these tools to be able to figure out what was going on inside of me and why I had experienced those challenges and um, and, and how to integrate them moving forward. Mm. Okay. So you start to discover meditation. Yeah. And you're working at <laughs> LinkedIn. Then, working at LinkedIn. And then my parents, um, they kept telling me about this book. They were like, gotta read this book stuff. You're going to love it. It's going to change your life. 
And I just kept resisting it. Like I was like, no, I'm good. Like I'm, I'm really busy or <laughs> pushing it off. And the, um, finally one, I think it was over the holidays or something. They literally handed me a copy and were like, okay, you have to read this. You're going to love it. And it was, um, Dr. Martin Seligman's book flourish, which is all about the study of positive psychology. And I read it in like two hours and I, you know, totally went over and was like, okay, once again, you were right. I, I love this. <laughs> I can't believe that there's science behind these things that I'm so passionate about and curious about and that there are people who are delving into this and from there it just sort of became my my passion I mean I literally would read academic articles over the weekend and like just I was just obsessed and finally I discovered that they have this master's program and I decided on a whim to apply I thought you know like oh I'm not I'm not uh, mature enough for this and I don't have enough experience under my belt and, you know, all that kind of narrative. And then I thought, I'll just take it, take a chance. What's the worst that can happen? And I, I got in. And so I ended up flying back and forth to Philadelphia from San Francisco for a year to do the program. And then I got to go back and teach at Penn as well afterwards, which was really fun. And yeah, it was just an amazing amazing experience and a real, I would say like pivot point for me in, in my life and my career. what did you learn from teaching? Um, I think that, gosh, I love to, I love teaching. There's so much, there's so much goodness in that. Um, I think one key thing I learned from teaching is that we're, we all have this natural curiosity, like this desire to, to know and to explore and to grow. And if you can just tap into that in a way that resonates with people, you don't need to worry about them. They'll just do their own stuff. Like, right. They'll just go off and like you see that with all of the people who are self-directing their own education online right now, right? Like there's, there's so much potential when you find something that you're really interested and curious about. In grad school, it was different because, you know, everyone who was there was like me. They were like a hundred out of a hundred obsessed with positive psychology. So no one needed any support in terms of like getting motivated or anything like that. I expect it would be much harder for, um, for someone like a first grade teacher, some people who I would have, I have the most respect for. Um, but for me, it was just about, like I, I learned more in teaching than, I, than I'm, I'm sure I conveyed or imparted upon anyone. Mm. <laughs> and that, that holds true to this day. I mean, teaching is a big part of what I've done in my career after Penn. And every time that I am in an, experience where I'm supposed to convey information, I end up learning far more than, than I ever share. Why do you think that is? Hmm. You ask such good questions. You're such a curious person. I love it. Um, hmm. I think it's because we can get locked into the idea that we know everything, right? Like for these roles, I'm the one who knows something and you are the one who needs to learn what I know. Like that kind of, it's very old school, right? <laughs> um, but instead, I guess there's a more interesting relationship to be had when you're meeting as equals in the field of discovery together. And I'm bringing my set of experience and knowledge, you're bringing yours. I have no way of knowing yours. And the more that I can, it's, it's like the alchemy where you meet in the middle. Like it's, it should be like a mutual learning experience, right? Like, like right now, like I'm learning from you how to ask great questions right now for a podcast. Like I'm mentally taking notes about how, how to, how you're digging in and what you're doing that's different than what I've seen before and like all that kind of stuff, even if it's not really conscious. And I think that, I think that like the future of learning is really about that meeting place. Like 
where you come together and learn together and co-create something rather than a transfer of knowledge from A to B. It's the difference from a hierarchical relationship versus a peer relationship. Totally. And when it's a peer okay. relationship, it's such a beautiful experience and both sides really benefit. When it's hierarchical, it, the tendency is I know all the information and I'm going to give it to you. And I think sometimes when people or when I've said I don't like school in the past, it's coming from a place of feeling like I'm being taught to rather than taught with. Right, right. That makes so much sense. Um, and and why would anyone like that? Yeah, seriously. No one likes to be talked down to. Like my my dad has this thing. Oh, I'm gonna mess up the line. He has this line he always says about no one wants to be told the answers, but everyone wants help in finding them. And I'm, he it's some quote from somewhere. So credit to whoever said it. But I think that that's kind of it's a, such an back to intention, such a beautiful intention to have, like, I don't have the answers for you. And, you know, that's, that should be good. Like it, it should be these answers that come from within that are informed by the wisdom that we can collect and integrate and test against our own assumptions and knowledge and experience and all of that stuff. At least, at least that's become my perspective over time. But one mentor who did have the answers for you, at least in one moment, is a mentor of yours who said, living is a spiritual practice. Mm. Why did that hit you so hard in one specific moment? I used to think that to be a good, moral, spiritual, virtuous person, happened in like your and this kind of goes back to I guess the meditation part but like meditation happens when you're meditating right like you put your little timer on you sit down and you do your 20 minutes and then you get up and you go back to normal life and it's kind of like a <laughs> you know um but what if it's actually about what you do the rest of the time. Like, what if it's about how you live and how you treat people and how you carry yourself and how you, how you honor people and just like every single thing that you do. And that was a massive shift for me because I, I sort of had like an inclination at the beginning of this when I was really into meditation of like, I think I want to go be like a monk. Like, I think like I want to go and, and just live in a monastery and like really pursue this, this practice. And I read this quote by the Dalai Lama where he said that there is more spiritual growth to be had in one night of ministering to a sick child by a mother than there is in years of meditation in a monastery. Wow. And I know, so good. And it was like that moment for me of, wow, actually I can be here and I can live and I'm gonna learn so much more. And honestly, that, that line has come to have major resonance for me in my own life. Um, I've become a full-time caregiver for my partner who is, uh, incredibly ill and my life is now heavily focused in many ways on being a caregiver for somebody who is very sick and I come back to that a lot as a reminder that this is this is where I practice like this is where I can be of service and this is where I can be work on being good and being better and making my little difference and I find a lot of peace and strength and empowerment in that. Do you think that the moments you had, all the moments leading up prepared you to be the best caregiver you could possibly be? I do. Thank you for asking that. I, I think that, I think that, um, it would be, it would be really hard in a lot of moments without some of these not that it isn't hard, um, but it would be much harder without some of these 
kind of, I guess, lessons or things that I've been reflecting on and learning about. And I do believe, and maybe it's naive, but I do believe that for all of us, we're, we're learning what we need in this moment to prepare us for the future moments. And I feel, I feel really grateful for all of those lessons and for whatever this time is teaching me, even though right now I, I can't see it. I don't have any sort of perspective on it, but having that faith, I guess, that what I'm navigating will have a meaning in some way that, and you know, that I'll find a way to make it have a meaning. Um, I think, I think that can be really comforting when you're going through hard times. How do you have the faith? (sighs) Another great question. I guess it comes back to, uh, so there's this other Buddhist master who has really shaped my perspective over the last few years um, named Shanti Deva. And he has this fantastic piece of wisdom, which I think like I could just spend my whole life just focusing on just this one thing. And I still would have so much left to learn, but it's um, if basically the gist of it is that if you have a problem, if you can solve it, then don't worry about it. And if you can't solve it, don't worry about it. And like so much of our pain is about trying to control the uncontrollable and trying to like move, move the pieces of the world into a configuration that we like and that makes sense to us and that pleases us. And then life just goes and like hits you in the stomach, right? Like we all are going to have those moments where it's like, oops, you thought you, you thought you were working towards this thing and like, never mind. <laughs> um, and you, your, your pieces are all moved around. You're like, what the heck? <laughs> I had everything just right. That's how I felt. Like I had everything just right. And then the board got spilled over. And really the, the truth is that the board is just going to keep getting flipped over, over again. And I can, yes, I can work towards having control where I can. That's super important for resilience and for well-being. but accepting the limits of my control and accepting that I am, I'm here right now. This is the situation I have to manage through it and navigate through it. And I can do that with joy or I can do that with despair. And actually that is something that I can, I have some ability to choose. Some days it's very hard and some days it's impossible, but other days I, you know, I can, I can find it. And I think that, I think it's about that for me, that that's where the, the faith comes from is like this recognition that we're all in this challenging world together we're all trying our best everyone is just trying to figure it all out and there are so many moments of goodness and beauty that are still possible that are still happening even when things are really hard and painful and the more that we can amplify those and support people in them and help them to help them blossom a little in their own lives. Like that's where the the beauty I think is even amidst the suffering. Um, And then at the end of the day, like the other place, my, my faith in all this comes from is my, my belief that like compassion and altruism are the thing that we're here to do. And in many ways I have been given this, profound gift to really walk the talk on that and to learn from my current experience about about what that is and I can be grateful for that and the fact that I can be grateful for that gives me faith it's beautiful when the board collapses all of a sudden as it inevitably will for all of us what are some of the things we can do to make sure we don't step on a piece love it 
I think, I think the that harms us is we try to pretend everything's okay. We try to pretend that the board is like exactly right where it was and that <laughs> nothing has happened, right? Like everything's fine, like nothing to see here. And <laughs> so we don't address the fact that like, actually there's a piece like way over there and there's another one like way over here and that guy's chopped in half and like all that is okay. It's what, what reality is. And so I think that the main thing I would say is like the, the main in order when the board gets flipped over, take some time and look at what happened and allow yourself to feel those emotions, like feeling the grief and the anger and the frustration and the rage and the jealousy and all of these emotions that are more traditionally challenging for us. If we allow ourselves to feel that, then we can, we can heal from it and move on. But too often, I think what happens is we don't allow ourselves like me, you know, in my, my earlier story, like we don't allow ourselves to notice and attend to those feelings most because we haven't really been taught how to deal with pain like you know most most of us are never taught like how to suffer in dignity right and so if if you can just give yourself that space and the support that you need from people and from professionals and from nature and from the world in order to do that I think that we can we can reduce a lot of the unnecessary suffering and like by attending to the pain. So for me, that's been a profound learning that I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still working on. It's still something I'm, I have to, to practice every day. Who do you personally rely on when things go awry? Hmm. I rely on my family members. I'm very lucky to have a very loving and supportive family. I, and um, some very dear friends who are really just, again, incredible people who have taught me how to hold space for my emotions and process them, you know, people who are, who I'm just so blessed to have in my life. Um, And then I rely a lot on people I don't know, um, which is to say I rely on um, I guess like wisdom. So like things like the, the books I've mentioned, I rely on art, poetry, literature, movies, and film, like all that stuff I find is like, this can be a powerful tool for for me. Um, and I also am very, uplifted by the people who I serve at my company because part of part of the work I do is helping people to tap into these gifts and to do good using them and so I have this immense privilege of getting to see people being brave and doing good things all the time and it is so inspiring and so elevating and it makes me feel so optimistic about the world and so joyful to see people doing that stuff. And so I don't know these people personally for the most part, but I'm privileged to bear witness to some of their, their growth. And that really inspires me too. Mm, It's beautiful. And you mentioned your company and you, I was shocked to learn that you were procrastinating on starting it for something like three years. Is that true? A really long time. I was really afraid. Um, I don't know if anyone can, if you can relate to that or if anyone out there can relate, but it was one of those things that was so dear to me. Like it felt like so precious and it was, I was afraid there's like a noble reason and there's a not so noble reason. The noble reason was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not like going to kind of do it. Well, actually, I don't think either of them are noble now that I'm thinking about it. But one of the fears was like, I'm not going to be good enough to make this happen, to make it what I want it to be. And then the really kind of like egotistical fear was, 
I won't be able to make it as good as it is in my head. So why bother? Wow. <laughs> right. Like, I think, I think, um, I think a lot of us hold ourselves back from pursuing our real dreams very frequently because of fears like this. And, um, it took me, the reason I ended up actually starting it was because Alex, my partner had gotten ill and I was spending, I was working at LinkedIn, um, still, and I had, you know, I was in this demanding role. I was working a lot. And then Alex was, had this mystery illness. We couldn't figure out what it was. And so basically all I was doing in my free time was either taking care of him or reading me medical journals, trying to figure out what he, what disease he had and like trying to figure out what, how to tell the doctor what blood tests to order and all that kind of nonsense. And, um, I just kept feeling like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to lose this thing that really matters to me unless I do something about it. And then Alex um, was the one who gave me a push and said, like, you need to do this, like, and you just need to start small. You just need to do something. And that advice is the advice I give to people all the time now. Like, you don't need, the reason I didn't start is because I was like, well, how am I going to make it like a multi-million dollar company within six months? <laughs> right? Like we have these, we have these big dreams, which is so great and so important. But also I think some of us who dream really big are really bad at starting small, but the only way to get big is to start small. And so that has, that was a huge learning for me as well. Um, I don't, I don't know if you can relate to that, but I, I think that we, um, something is always better than nothing and doing something can lead to a some things that you can't imagine. Where do those big expectations come from? And the, the time frame in such a short time, like it's not even possible, right? Like in very rare cases, isn't but it, we build it up not. in our head that it's going to be like that. Where do you think that comes from? I think honestly, I mean, I call it old happy culture, which is the culture that I mentioned at the beginning. It's this narrative in society that we have to be perfect we have to constantly be productive we have to be better than the person next to us we have to achieve and achieve and achieve and work ourselves till we burn out and because once we do that then we'll be worthy of happiness and we will finally earn it but the problem is there's never a point where that works um never ever unfortunately <laughs> so I think honestly like this is why I think the work is the, the work is so important for me because it just shows how ingrained these concepts are for us and how like I'm still battling those tendencies in myself, even though I've made it my mission to kind of help to name them and help people to spot them in their, their own lives. And so um, that's definitely where it comes from because it's not like I sat down consciously and was like, this is what I need to do to be successful. Right. It was just this like little package that dropped into my brain at some point and was like, this is what success looks like. And you need to achieve it, which is, which is nonsense. Like there's no definition of success that is wildly applicable for everyone. That's isn't the whole point of doing your own thing that you get to define that in a way as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I think it comes from. It's crazy that we inherit so much good from the world, like technology and, and all this amazing stuff that we didn't create water bottle. You're just drinking like someone else created that. And we have a system now where water bottles come to us and we can drink them. But then there's all these beliefs and stuff mm -hmm. that get ingrained into us also that we didn't choose and that we need to maybe deprogram. Mm -hmm. So it's like this constant battle of like being appreciative for all the good we're sitting on and that we didn't do anything to create if you're fortunate enough to be in that position, mm -hmm. but also understand like there's some bad that comes with the good that was built on top of the system. Mm -hmm. So how do you think about navigating that? That's so wise. I've actually never considered it in that framework before. I think that's really insightful. I think like the analogy for me that comes to mind hearing you talk is pulling weeds and planting flowers, you know, like mm. how do we, how do we amplify the good and plant the flowers for the future? And then how do we pull the weeds where they're not serving us? So for me, 
thinking about that, there's so many applications, right? Like there's, if you think about it from a kind of global macro perspective, like where we choose to pull the weeds includes doing things like choosing where we spend our money, right? Like only funneling it to companies that support, you know, addressing global warming and doing all this kind of stuff um, that have fair labor conditions that promote um, equality within the workplace, like all of those kinds of things. And so that's one way of pulling weeds. Another way of planting flowers on a macro level is like you can start a company and you can commit to equity and you can commit to these practices, or you can become a leader at a company and prioritize doing that, or you can be an employee at a company and work to organize events that help to support it. Um, so there's like that level of it. And then there's the interpersonal, sorry, the, I guess there's inter and then intrapersonal. There's interpersonal in terms of like, how do we relate to one another in a way where we're bringing out the best in each other and we're supporting one another and being who we authentically are in a way that does the greatest good in the world. Like, what does it look like for me to be in relation to you and to, to do that? And then there's as you mentioned, the intrapersonal of uh, pulling the weeds of these beliefs that no longer serve us and planting the flowers of the ones that are more conducive to long-term well-being, both individual and collective. And I think that it's a it's a really interesting way to think about it. So I really like I really appreciate you um, you defining it so in such a beautiful and clear way. Thank you. Well. Going back to you, I want to know about your whole brand online, so to speak, is about happiness. And you post about it all the time. You write about it. If you find yourself feeling not happy in any given moment, how do you reconcile that? And how do you think about that? That is another great question. I, I feel not happy quite frequently, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you know, I think that, um, and I'm sorry if you can hear music in the background, there's a band on the street apparently. Um, but the, the way that I think about it is that it, I think a manifestation of old happy culture is having the pressure to feel happy and smiley all the time, right? And a lot of people within positive psychology as a field don't appreciate that it's called positive psychology because it makes it sound like that. Like it makes it sound like the yellow smiley face <laughs> is our goal. And I think that the better word is really uh, flourishing, like living a, a, a flourishing or a meaningful life. But happiness is something that we all know and we all talk about and it's kind of central for all of us. And that's really why I chose it as our company name and is to be so central to the brand because I think that Happiness, true happiness for me is not about satisfying all of your material desires and extrinsic goals. And that can be an element for sure to a certain degree for all of us. But I think that happiness has room for every emotion. Living a flourishing or living a truly happy life means that you're going to feel sad because there is literally no way that you can have meaning in your life and never feel sad. Because if you want something, if you wanna make a difference in the world, if you wanna love people, if you want to do something courageous and brave, you are gonna experience all of the more challenging emotions that go along with that, including sadness, because you know the people we love are gonna die and we are going to experience many setbacks and challenges, but like, what's the other option? Not going for it and not having those relationships and living a life that's actually devoid of meaning. Um, lots of people do choose that path because it's a lot safer and easier. And that's, to me, that's not happiness. That's numb, numbing oneself, right? Um, and so I think it's really important to share about that. That's why I'm so happy that there's such a increased conversation happening around mental health in the world and people sharing their stories about it because people need to know that 
other people feel sad and other people struggle and have really hard times. And um, sometimes they don't want to get out of bed in the morning and sometimes they feel really angry for no reason. And like, whatever you're feeling, it's all okay. And so that is the kind of acceptance I've been working over the years to give myself um, and to also try to extend to, to other people as well um, to remind them. Like, I think it's all about reminding each other. Like, for, that's been a huge thing I've been thinking about lately. Like, sometimes when I forget something, I need someone to remind me of it. It's something I know in my heart, right? But I need someone to just tell it to me and like, let me know and bring it to the top of my mind again. And so there's this image I have of all of us. It's like these little dots like floating around and we're all just ping ponging around and we're all just reminding each other, like you are wonderful and you are loved and you're going to make a difference and you matter and your feelings are okay. And you can stop and rest like all of these lovely little ping pong messages. And um, I think that that's what we, we can do for each other. And that's so beautiful. That is really beautiful. And I think what you're talking about touches on a point I think about a lot, which is that it's really important to state the obvious, even though it might be obvious to you, even though you might've heard it a thousand times, that doesn't mean that the thousand and first time <laughs> is pointless. It actually is important because it'll bring it top of your mind, make you think about that thing again, mm -hmm. fill you with those emotions if you need to, take that action you need to take. And I would encourage everyone listening and myself to state the obvious more and to realize like one thing that I did constantly was to just remind myself, I love myself over and over mm -hmm. and over again. And it's like such an obvious thing. We should all love ourselves, but the mere act of reminding it was just made me feel better and better. And the more I did it, the better life got. And so I'm mm -hmm. curious for you, has, has there been any obvious things you've reminded yourself often? Oh, I love that so much. Um, who let's see lately over the years I guess I've been reminding myself that it's okay to feel it's just that's okay like I think I've always been a really sensitive person anyone anyone in my family who's listening to this can attest to that like always big feelings and big emotions and I think I, at some point I got shamed for that in school or in in some location and so I shut everything down and tried to just be more like a robot than a human and unlearning that has been the work of a lot of years a lot of therapy a lot of inner work and work in support with, you know, my community. So it's okay to feel that's one that has been really present in my life for the last little while. What's the most amazing part about feeling so deeply? Hmm. Everything is like, there's so much beauty, I guess, like finding the beauty in the little things. Um, and I think that, ironically, I think that the more that I have allowed myself to tap into my feelings, and obviously this is specifically mostly about challenging feelings, the more I've allowed myself to tap in and feel them, that happier I have become. And they have like unleashed this new creative energy within me that I never had access to before. And so it's been kind of mind blowing that in this kind of suppressing of my emotions, I was also tamping down this expression of my, myself in this other way. And that has been a real surprise <laughs> and a real, a really interesting thing to discover that I'm so grateful for. Yeah. As we get more and more in touch with ourselves, it seems as if the creative expression of ourselves flourishes and mm. to go back to that word. And I'm curious if you could share an example from your life of how that is manifested. Yeah. I mean, so 
um, when I quit my job last year to work full time on the new hobby, I started thinking about how I wanted to build our community. And um, for me, I thought like Instagram seems like a good place for it. I think it's like probably the most aligned platform and all that kind of stuff. And so I started to think about what could I do on Instagram that's like kind of different. And so I landed on the idea that, oh, I'm going to, I'll make little pictures. I'll start learning how to, to create stuff. I didn't want to just post quotes or anything like that. I wanted it to be something that felt a little bit, a little bit more unique. And so I started teaching myself graphic design and I would, I mean, I would, I spent hours on it. Um, you know, every kind of minute that I wasn't taking care of Alex or doing any of that stuff, I would be sort of just like playing around with it. And I found this unbelievable joy in it. It, it reminds me of the joy I found when I first started writing that has since kind of like drained away in that, at least in this moment, you know, how things kind of ebb and flow. But the great thing about it was that I had no expectations for myself, like, because I'd never done anything like that before. And so it was just fun. It was just like this play for me. And the other great thing was that because I was constantly um, bouncing in between like, I need to do something here for the house and here for Alex. And then I only had like 10 minutes. It was all just like kind of little things I could fit into my day. And so I just started playing with it. And then over time, I just discovered this immense joy in creating these abstract visual images to reflect emotions and thoughts and feelings and psychological transformations and service and like all these things I'm passionate about. And it's become this real, uh, unbelievable joy for me and to the point that I something I never in my wildest dreams happened where there are people who are buying prints of things that I've made and putting them on their walls and I just truly like have to pinch myself because if you had told me that a year ago I never in my wildest dreams would have believed it and it's a it's it's come about and parallel with this time of immense pain in my own life and in allowing myself to process and work through it in this medium it's really helped me I think to experience it in a way that I never would have otherwise so it's been this like amazing gift for me that I just feel so grateful for and the illustrations are incredible you know they're just <laughs> it's so eye-catching and they represent such great themes so I'm curious, like what's going through your head when you're creating one of these images? I think I usually, I've figured out a process now. It took a lot of trial and error and it also took a while to figure out like what I liked and what I didn't and what style I liked and all that kind of stuff. But um, I've started, the main process I have right now is I start with an idea of a message that I want to share. And that might come from, my more writing background versus an art background, which I obviously don't have. Um, I don't have any kind of specific talent in terms of like, you could show me a canvas and I can imagine something like beautiful from scratch. Like that's just not something that is within me at this point in time. But I like to have a kind of message in mind, like almost like a meditation. So um, the, the mantra in my head might be like, um, you know, like sharing kindness impacts the giver just as much as the receiver, something like that. And then I sort of just try and bring myself into a, I guess it's kind of like a meditative flow state of just trying to see like how I might visualize that. And I guess I've always imagined things in colors and, and shapes and love to doodle those kind of abstract designs. And so it's like, okay, if I'm visualizing kindness, like what color is kindness to me? Or how does it look and what does it feel like? And then I just play with it and just try and see what comes up. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I am I just have been trying to really like give myself grace on that and just say like, yeah, this is just something that you're doing to express yourself and not anything. It doesn't have to be anything else. Um, so it, I'm, I guess I'm very lucky that it 
I get into like a pretty deep flow state and sometimes things just come out and those are, those are the best times. <laughs> it doesn't always happen though. How do you not trick yourself into going the old happy way when mm-hmm. you are doing this? Because it seems like the creations come from a place of pure joy and the fact that you just want to create them. And then now you're posting them and letting the world see them. Mm-hmm. And now people are liking it. And now you could see how many likes each one has. <laughs> so like, how do you, so hard. How, how do you let go of that old script? Oh. It's so, such a good question and something I feel so strongly about because like, just as I was saying before, like, it's so hard to fight these old happy tentacles. Like they're everywhere and the world like conspires to put you back on that path. Um, So like, it would be a lie to say that I don't struggle with it. And like, if some, if I make something that I, I'm, and I get really excited about it and then like people don't seem to like it, it is kind of like a, there is the instant feeling of kind of like, oh, like rejection, right? Like, and um, what if I'm actually not good at this? And what if I've lost my skill or, you know, people don't like me anymore? Like all of those kinds of thoughts. So it it would be a lie to say that that never comes to me. So like, let's be real. Um, I think it's about having processes in place to make it less of a thing and to minimize it. Like I, I just saw actually that Instagram has, um, made the option to hide likes, which I think is a really good step, um, for the platform, for giving people that sort of control. The main thing for me that helped was a mindset shift of I'm making this for me. And then if it helps one person, I've done my job. If one person likes it, if it's if it connects with one person, then what an amazing bonus on top of something that I like. And that has been, helped me to kind of like release the the, the valve of expectations for myself and really consider how do you, how do you engage with um, any sort of platform or social media from a place of like, the, the place that got you there, like you talked about, right? Like the place that if it's coming from a place of joy, how do you not lose the place of joy when you go out and put it in public? And I think that's just the perfect way to describe it. And so there's, there's that mindset. Um, there's the focus on really engaging with the community and talking to people and like really connecting. Like I, again, not viewing it as like, this is a place where I push stuff out, but this is a place where like I meet people and we connect and we share and all that stuff. Um, and then coming back to like, is this an alignment with me? Is this an alignment with like my ultimate goal, which is to be of service to all humans? Like if, if I'm getting distracted and sucked into uh, worrying about likes or something like that, then that's not take, that's not keeping me in alignment. So like get back on track, buddy. Like that's kind of the, the mindset that I try to, I try to give myself and just catch myself when that does happen. You know, the word community is so uplifted in today's day and age, Mm. but I haven't seen many people uplift their own community like you have in terms of putting it on the newsletter. These are the people that have done great. These are the people's wins today. Like, it's so cool. So what do you think makes someone a good community manager? Hmm. I think it comes back to me the same thing that being a good leader is, which is being of service. Like, I don't think that there's this really great body of work um, by this researcher, Dr. Keltner out of Berkeley. And he wrote this amazing book um, about power. And I would recommend, I recommend it to everyone who's interested in these kinds of topics because it has so much that's profound to say. And essentially his thesis is that we rise in power due to what's good within us and we fall from power due to what is bad within us so what happens over and over again and like none of us need to reach to find examples of people who we know from the media and from celebrity and all sorts of other cultures who have done this right like people who have great talent or who are making a difference in the world they accumulate power in one sense or another whether that's fame or fortune or influence 
And then they, and the reason that they gain power is because they are advancing the greater good. Power is given by the collective when somebody is working towards the greater good. But what happens is that once you get in power, you forget that. <laughs> and you start to forget that what got you there is being of service. And what happens is people abuse their power. They cheat, they lie, they steal, they do things that are out of their integrity, all of these different things. And then they fall from power. And the reason is because they lost sight of what they were doing, which was serving. And so for me, any great leader of any, any kind, their primary job is me keeping that top of mind. Like how do you stay of service to the people that you're serving, whoever they are. And when I think about leaders who I've really admired in the past, who I've worked with, or people who I admire and look up to in the world, they're always those people who are really keeping that top of mind, no matter how quote unquote big they get, um, you know, no matter how successful or famous or whatever it is. How do you think they do that? intention going back to what we talked about I think honestly I think that might be a good part of it um humility like realizing keeping their egos in check um there's this concept called a quiet ego in psychology of reducing your ego and the benefits that it can bring um for your well-being are are pretty cool and I think that that's something important. I think that consciously almost humbling yourself. Um, and I'm thinking about, especially about people who have all sorts of privileges and renown. Um, I think that was probably pretty important at that, at that kind of level when people just start, you know, trying to do things for you all the time and make you happy and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think, I think it's about also like, for me, it comes back to one of the core pillars of our philosophy, which is recognition of our interconnectedness. Like we are all connected and we all have a role to play in making the world a better place, but no one's role is more important than anybody else's and everyone matters and every, we need, we need everyone, right? Like we, we all can make a difference where we are. And I think that keeping that in mind, that sense that we are, we are all just trying to do our best to make a difference. I think that that would be an antidote to the, 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 the tendency we have to fall from power because of what's what's bad in us Hmm. i think this would be a good place to bring up your life mission which i discovered when looking through some old articles you wrote which at least at the time you said your life mission is to help people find peace love and happiness in their inner lives so that they are empowered to make the world into a better place where does that come from Hmm. i do think it's evolved a little since then i think that um, I would say now that it's very similar, but really it's, it's more probably rooted in helping people to find, I'd say now it's probably just almost the exact same as the mission of the new happy, to be honest, which is to help people to discover their gifts in order to make the world a better place. So it's, it's really similar, less probably, um, on the inner peace front though, which is kind of interesting. I'm just reflecting on this now live. Um, it's Why? Why do you think it's less on the inner peace front? I guess I've become more convinced about action um, as so important for well-being. Um, like, I think that inner peace is obviously, one, a beautiful goal, two, probably not going to happen for me um, or, for, <laughs> or for most people, but like, it's great to work towards, obviously. Um, it's a, I, I think it's awesome to have those like highly aspirational goals. I'm a big believer in it. Um, but I think that, I guess it's more achievable also to say like the, the newer version, which is 
my belief is that we all have these gifts, things that we're good at, things that we're passionate about, things that we're excited about. And when we use those to help to make a difference in the world, whether that is through our work, through our, through our communities, through the way that we just show up and engage in the world, when we do that, we find happiness because we're integrating the, pr the process of both self-actualization and self-transcendence. And the more that we pursue those gifts, the more evolved they become and the more we can use them and the more that we offer them in service to other people, the more fulfilled we can become. And it's the integration between the two that's really where like the magic comes into play. And I think that we've done a really good job over the last like 20 years promoting the self-actualization side of things. And we have forgotten about the service side of things. And that's really like what I'm hoping to do with my work. Um, because as we've talked about previously, like you can self-actualize as long as you want, right? Like, and I, I think that it's, it ultimately isn't, and doesn't end up being enough just doing it for yourself. And I, I think that, you know, we could argue that there is no way to self-actualize without being of service to people, but there is certainly a paradigm right now of like achievement as the path to self-actualization in that way. So I think that I've come to see that maybe that's more achievable for people. Like people, we all have to work. We all have relationships. We all have communities that we're a part of and we can all do good where we are. And in doing that, I actually think that's the more tangible and practical way to find lasting happiness and ultimately maybe even back channel into more inner peace. And on the service piece, you know, I was listening to you talk on a podcast while I was at the gym and you said to people who don't know where to start their service, mm. look at what pain hits you the hardest. Mm. And I, I dropped what I was doing. I was like, oh my God, that is so good. I need to, I need to ask about that. Look at what pain hits you the hardest. So why is that such an important piece of service? Mm. Thank you for saying that. Um, what I see happen quite frequently, I saw it in myself when I was in a similar position looking for a purpose. And I, I see it with a lot of the people who I'd speak to when we're trying to figure out how to help people, whether you're saying like, I want a purpose or I want more meaning in my work, or I want a job that helps people, you know, kind of these common things that we hear. What happens quite frequently is that people think about themselves. They think, okay, well, what do I want? And we're never going to find purpose there because purpose is other oriented. It can't be about you. It's about others. Um, and so what happens is that people tie themselves in knots about it. They end up spiraling and getting really stuck because they can't figure out what will satisfy them when really it's about thinking about something that you want to help fix or a problem or other people. And I find that that question really helps people because it puts into focus the other in a really profound way. And then of course, ideally you want to find an alignment between the two. And like, that's kind of my whole point is where in the world is there a problem? There's no shortage of problems, right? So where is there a problem? that really makes you mad, that if you had a magic wand, you would fix it. And then what are the gifts you have? And then how do you bring them together to support that? And so I remember I was talking to a girlfriend of mine once who is really passionate about female empowerment. And she was working in a, um, uh, in a job at a law firm and was just really dissatisfied, really frustrated. She kept thinking like, I really want a more purposeful job. And she kept kind of convincing herself that she needed to up, overhaul her whole life in order to live a more purposeful life. And I found that this question can be really helpful because it immediately points out, like, you can help right now, like right here and right now, like my friend in the law firm, like she could do pro bono consulting 
or supporting for women who are in domestic violence situations. She could volunteer to be a big sister. She could do phone banking for female candidates. Like there are so many things that you can start to do right away. And I think, I hope that that's more empowering for people to get them started on the path. Because once you get going, you're kind of the races and then magic happen where you start unfolding and you start learning and meeting people and finding out more about yourself. And that's when like the momentum really builds and it becomes very powerful and very effective. But it's often that first step that yeah. people need the to get the jump off point. And one of the ways you have those first steps is the new happy challenges. Mm-hmm. What inspired you to create these challenges? And if you could talk a little bit about what they are for people who yeah, don't know. Yeah, of course. So um, we run these completely free well-being and um, fulfillment behavior change challenges. We do them every other week for our community. Um, and they are based on this behavior change methodology that I've developed, um, to help people to facilitate meaningful change in their lives. And it's based on the latest research around how do we help people to change? And they are between generally between like five to seven days long, depending on how long, um, warrants the curriculum that I designed for them. And what we do is every day they're given a specific prompt to complete. And it's usually an action. Sometimes it's a reflection, but I try to combine it with an action because that's a part of um, making real change happen. And they're given 24 hours to complete the prompt. And then they, um, they come back and they share and we highlight people's responses and we troubleshoot challenges and issues that people are going through. And then we guide them through this experience over the, the period of time for the challenge. And um, we use those to help people to start, really to get started, to give them that little boost that you're talking about. And I fundamentally believe that we're not supposed to change by ourselves. We're supposed to change in community. And what we're seeing with these challenges is really proving that out. The transformations that people have gone through and the... um, the support that people are willing to give one another and um, the profound experiences that people have. It's just a really beautiful thing. Um, And we do all sorts of different topics. So like uh, this week we did one about kindness. So it was all about how to be kinder. Um, The last one we did was, hmm, not sure I remember it. Uh, We did authenticity recently, um, compassion, we take on all these different topics that fall under our philosophy and then uh, guide people through it. And it's really just this wonderful, I mean, I've, it's the best part of my week. I love it. (laughs) How did you come up with that? Um, Really? It was just thinking like, how can I help people change? How can I, like, we all, we all are trying to do something that we, you know, we're trying to tackle a goal or, trying to evolve into a specific type of person. And I kept thinking, well, what can, what can we do as, um, as an organization to support people in changing in the way that they want to? And the thing that has been a real insight for me is that I think prior to navigating this experience with Alex, the product that I would have designed here would, would have been very different. It would have been like, <laughs> here's an hour long exercise and a workbook and like, like it's just like a really kind of more, much more heavy duty learning experience and knowing what it's like to be, to have a lot of responsibilities. I knew that something like that would never work for me if I was the end user of this product. And so challenging myself to create something that could have an impact and it takes you less than five minutes a day and you do it while you're having fun on Instagram. That was like my, my design challenge. And, um, so that's really, that's the more practical kind of product development side of things. That's been kind of fun to figure out. I love it. And, you know, with all these things that you're doing, how do you feel and stop the feeling of overwhelm. I feel like you're doing a million different things in a million different places. Do you ever feel like, wow, this is, this is so much, or you feel joy from doing it and it doesn't ever seem like a lot. Mm. No, there are definitely days where I feel overwhelmed. Um, 
I think that a lot of it was trial and error, like figuring it out as I went, what, what worked for me, what I like to do. And it, it does come back to what you said about how do I keep the joy in it and keep it as something that's fun for me. And uh, again, I really think part of it is like, um, there's a lot of sadness in my days because of what Alex and I are going through and the, what I want to experience when I'm working on this is that joy and joy is the right word because I think joy encompasses sadness. It has, it has the space for that. It's a much more human experience than something like pure pleasure or, you know, gratification or something like that. So it's finding, finding the things that bring me joy. That's like a kind of more philosophical level. And then on a practical level, figuring out like my systems and processes and then being comfortable with imperfections. Like I think getting comfortable with just shipping something and sending it out the door and being like, okay, it's not perfect, but it's good enough. <laughs> you know, like I, like, for example, I, I try to, my process for creating art is every morning I give myself, I, I do it the first thing in the morning. I give myself an hour when the hour is up, I post whatever I have. And there have been some days that I get it done in like 10 minutes. There are some days where I don't get anything done that I really like, and I will hold myself back on those rare days. But most of the time, even if it's just, if I think it's good enough, I'll, I'll share it. Same goes for newsletter and the blog and the podcasts and the challenges and all that kind of stuff. Like I set aside a chunk of time, I give it to myself and then you know, kind of wherever it's at, I, I let it fly. And I think, um, I think it's okay to be kind of kind to ourselves about that stuff when we're, when we're creating content, I don't know what you're, how you handle it. I, I know it's a, a major challenge for a lot of us as creators. What's the, the quality bar you think about? Hmm. Um, do I like this? Like, would I enjoy this? <laughs> it's kind of, hard. <laughs> um, but that's what I try to do. Um, like would I find value in this or, um, I sometimes try and pretend to be somebody else. Like, would I send this to somebody mm. is something I've found really useful. Like, Oh, would I, if I saw this, would I share it either on my feed or with a friend or even just screenshot it? Like anything like that. Um, that's, that's one that I have, but what's yours? I'm really curious. It's a great question. <laughs> well, I think about just having less of a filter. When mm -hmm. I was really insecure, I was like, should I post this at this time? Should I do this mm -hmm. at the, and then as the barriers to myself came down mm -hmm. over the past two years, I've been really open and willing to share because it's okay if you see my flaws. It's okay if if yeah. things aren't perfectly worded. It's okay because I'm content, I'm whole. So even if I make a mistake, that doesn't reflect on who I am as a human being. So that's kind of how I think I about it. That. I have goosebumps. That's so great. Isn't that yeah. amazing? Like, like when you hear yourself say that, like, don't you just feel so proud of yourself? That's amazing. I do because it it's come from a long place of, of yeah. insecurity and not self-awareness and, and deep fear without even realizing it. And then just going inward has allowed me to express who I truly am and on a, unapologetically. And that's, that's just a beautiful so place to operate from. That's amazing. And it feeds into everything you do, right? Like it becomes, it's, it's operating from a place of who you are and that clarity and centeredness that imbues everything. And I think it, people feel that. Like I feel it from you. People can tell and it speaks to them because it makes you feel less alone, right? And that's lovely and just so wonderful. Yeah. So I'd love to wrap this conversation off with a simple question, which is what is happiness to you, Stephanie? Hmm. Happiness to me is
I guess in the shortest definition, it would be doing good, doing good myself, doing good for others, doing good for the world. And in that you end up feeling good and you end up making a difference and you kind of get all the byproducts that we all want. Um, so that's, that's my definition. And I think that I actually think it's a, such a good question for all of us to ask ourselves because it helps us to make sure we're not caught up in somebody else's definition of happiness. Happiness is doing good. That's one that I'm going to be thinking about often and maybe will help inform some of my own definition of happiness going forward. Thank you, Stephanie, for this Thank incredible you. conversation. I'm better off for having it. And hopefully people who are listening are as well. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a joy. And I really appreciate how you're living your new happy of using your gifts to help people with this. It's really beautiful. And you have a, you have a real gift and talent and I'm really grateful that you had me here. Thank you. I'm grateful Thank to you. have you here. Truly.